Good evening, everyone. I'm sure this thing's on. We're so grateful for your presence tonight. Glad you uh, chose to be in the place that God wants you to be, so we're very, very thankful for that. And so we want to remember again, as we said this morning, so just want to mention again, tomorrow is Memorial Day, so we got some veterans in here. You got veterans in your family or whatever, make sure that you thank them, let you know, let them know that you appreciate them uh, because we need to do, they're the ones that defend our freedom and we greatly appreciate them for doing that. On our uh, sick list, just to, again to remind you, Jim Gann and our fellow Torbett, uh, Evelyn and Darlene Peel, uh, Keisha's dad, uh, Keisha's Uncle Harper, who has cancer. Um, Keisha's having some, some issues tonight. That's why she's not here. So uh, hopefully she'll be back on Wednesday night. Um, Harley Bowers has cancer. I want to remember him. Uh, Eva Sue and Fanny continue to remember them. Jack Gooden, uh, which is Joanne's great nephew, uh, young man who has cancer. Keep him in your prayers. Uh, Chuck Knight, who had the triple bypass, doing well, doing much better, but still want to pray for him. Monty Simmons, uh, another friend of Maurice, who's going to be having uh, bypass surgery uh, probably sometime soon. Pray that for him that that goes well. Uh, John says he's feeling better tonight with his, his heart issues, so, uh, but let's continue to pray for him as the doctors get all that straightened out and things will be good with him. Uh, Chester, of course, over at NHC, and, and Tommy Hayes is also over at NHC, so let's remember them and continue to pray that they will uh, improve and get better. All right, that's all I have, so we're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl. Uh, at the, after the second song, Brother Steve will lead us in our uh, opening prayer, and then at the conclusion of services, Brother John has our closing prayers. Brother Cheryl. Please get your songbook and turn to number 240. Number 240. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. Savior calls, I will give an answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right, he calls me. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. 
387 is what we're going to sign. 387 is what we're going to sign. No, not 388. I don't know 388, but I don't know if I ever signed it. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. May we bow and pray together, please. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings of life that you've given to us. You're just so good to us, Father, and I pray that we don't thank you enough for it. But, Father, we love you with all of our heart, and we are so appreciative of all you do for us. Dear Father, we're thankful for everybody that's here tonight. We ask you to please watch over us. We ask you to be with Mark tonight as he brings us his lesson. And you open our minds and our hearts that we'll absorb what he's prepared to teach us. Father, there are quite a few names read out while ago that are sick and having problems and situations. And we ask that you put your loving hand around them and comfort them. And Father, we ask you to comfort their families and help them. We have people that are grieving that have had lost loved ones and have problems and, and different things going on in their lives. And sometimes problems in life can be just as serious as a as an illness can work on us, Father, and we ask you to please help us through those times. We ask you to help us be strong and face our situations. We ask you to help us to treat our fellow man in a way that's pleasing to you. And now, Father, as we start our service here, we ask you to help us Worship you tonight in a way that's pleasing to you. Forgive us from our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please turn your song book to number 425. Let's sign this before the lesson.
friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Once again, good evening, everyone. We're thankful for your presence. If you would, please be turning in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. That's where our study will be tonight, Revelation, chapter 3. For the last couple of months, we've been engaged in a study on Sunday nights of the letters to the seven churches in Asia. As we've noted, these were pen was put to parchment by the Apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the speaker talking to the Christians at these churches. So we have looked at these seven churches that are found, these letters are found in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, and as I told you, Wednesday night we started uh, last Wednesday evening, a new Bible study class on the book of Revelation and primarily the doctrine of premillennialism. So we're looking some at the book of Revelation as background. We're mainly going to focus on premillennialism. And so I told you Wednesday night that I'd actually started this series on Sunday night. It's kind of an introduction to the book of Revelation and, and some of the things that we see there. So we've looked at these churches so far we have looked at the church at Ephesus, we've looked at Smyrna, we have looked at Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and in our last lesson in this series, we looked at the church in Philadelphia. And so finally, we come to the last church, the seventh church. Again, we did them in the order that the Bible has them. Tonight, we come to the church at Laodicea. And this is the seventh and final one. Now, as we normally do, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background about the city of Laodicea. What, what were the Christians there dealing with? Well, Laodicea was located east of the city and, and the congregation in Ephesus. It was located on some trade routes. And so, therefore, it, it was a wealthy city. There was a lot of money being made in Laodicea. It was known for textiles. It was also known for its banking industry. So a lot of money there, a lot of wealthy people who've done very well uh, in commerce. As you would expect, like we've seen with the other cities, there were quite a few Roman temples there dedicated to their false gods. So the Christians there would have seen this all the time. So there are some temples there to the false gods such as Apollo and Artemis and Aphrodite. Those were some of the bigger ones that were there. And the Christians were also, they were being persecuted there just like the others were. At the time this was written by the Roman emperor, his name was Domitian. And we will have a lot more to say about Domitian, Lord willing, in our Wednesday night study as we go through this. But the key thing about Domitian was that he was a proponent, and for obvious reasons, of emperor worship. And so in other words, Domitian had declared that he was to be worshiped as a god. And so the Christians here had to deal with that. Uh, and so let's take a look at this letter to the church at Laodicea 
and then we will dig into this and see what lessons that we can learn now that we've got a little bit of background about what these Christians are facing. So Revelation chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 15, uh, 14, excuse me, and we will read through the end of the chapter, verse 22. So Revelation beginning in chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. So once again, we notice here that the speaker is Jesus. He is the one talking to the churches, all seven of them. And so that's the case we've seen with every one. He is described in this letter as the Amen. Now that he's not described that way in the others. Each letter offers a little bit of a variation of description. But Jesus is called here the Amen. Now, that's a word that we typically end our prayers with. We get through with a prayer, we usually say in Christ's name, amen. Well, what does that word mean? This is a Hebrew word. What does it mean? Well, it means, so be it. Okay, so the things that we've prayed for, so be it, Lord. We want these things to be right. We want these things to be true. That's what that means. But there are other meanings of the word amen as well, and that's what it's talking about with Jesus here. The word also means firm. It means fixed. It means sure, something that you can be sure of. Jesus is all of those things. He's firm. He's fixed. He's sure. Jesus is faithful. He is true. And we notice here that it tells us he was there at the beginning of the creation. Okay, Jesus is eternal because Jesus is God. So hold your place there. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. We notice that Jesus has always been there. Colossians 1 and verse 16. For by him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And so going back to Revelation 3 again, it's what it says that he was there from the beginning of the creation of God. So clearly identifying Jesus as the speaker. Now, Jesus declares here in this letter, as he did for the other six, he does this in each one, he says there in verse 15, I know thy works. So again, expressing his omniscience, Jesus knows everything. He said, I've known everything that you've done, everything that you failed to do. I'm well aware of your situation here in Laodicea. This, again, the same thing he said to the other six uh, congregations. So in this letter, what does he have to say about and to the Laodiceans? While our last lesson, again, we looked at the church in Philadelphia, and I know that was three weeks ago before I went on vacation, but if you'll remember, 
the letter to the church of Philadelphia had only praise. There was no rebuking. There was no condemnation. The church at Philadelphia was doing a great job, and I told you we would be wise to emulate or copy them because they were very pleasing. Jesus didn't have anything to complain about with the church at Philadelphia. However, what we see in this letter, it's exactly the opposite. In the letter to Laodicea, there is no praise in this letter at all. It is only rebuke and condemnation. So apparently, this congregation, it was the worst, it was the least faithful out of the seven churches that were picked. As we said, there were more than seven congregations in Asia Minor, but for the seven that Jesus picked to send these messages to, apparently Laodicea, it's the worst. It's the least faithful. This is a church that we don't want to copy. We don't want to do what they were doing. So let's look at their spiritual condition. What was it that Jesus was so upset about with them, was so disappointed in? What did he have to say? Well, we see there uh, in verses 15 and 16 that Jesus refers to them as being lukewarm. That's how he did. You're, you're not hot. You're not cold. You're just lukewarm in your faith. It's very passive. It's not active. There's no zealousness in it. Uh, you're just really kind of lethargic, indifferent. That's how he describes them. Okay? Now think about, as we apply this to food or beverage, and I realize there are some exceptions, but think about most of the things that we eat or drink. Do we prefer those things to be lukewarm or do we prefer they're either hot or cold? Typically, they need to be hot or cold. Who heard of lukewarm ice cream? Probably don't want that. That sounds disgusting, and it is disgusting. It's melted, and you know, who wants to eat that? Or if we're drinking a Coke or, or a tea, we want that to be ice, or right? I want it to be ice cold. It's supposed to be cold. Who wants lukewarm soup? Most people don't. It should be hot. Or if you're eating a steak or something, You'd like that to be pretty hot, not so hot that it burns your mouth, but you want it to be hot, not just kind of room temperature, right? So most things that are lukewarm are kind of gross and disgusting, and they're not very appetizing, and that's not really what we want to eat. So being lukewarm in the faith is something like that. It meant that their spiritual state was very offensive to God, just like lukewarm food is offensive to us. God, I don't want to eat that. If this is offensive to God, and he's letting us know that God is going to reject them for their lukewarmness, unless, of course, they repent. We'll get to that in a little bit later. But they're going to be rejected if they don't change their ways. So God prefers, Jesus says here, I would rather you be either hot or cold one of those two extremes rather than this kind of wishy-washy stuff in the middle. Now, when we think about this a little bit deeper, the hot part, well, that's easy to understand. Well, of course God would prefer that we be hot in the faith, right? That God would want us to be fervent. He would want us to be zealous, on fire for our service to him. So that makes perfect sense that Jesus said, I, I'd rather that you be hot. Well, of course. But Jesus also said, I'd rather you be cold. What? Now, at first glance, you're thinking, what? wait a minute. That, I mean, surely lukewarm is better than cold. So what is he talking about cold? Well, he's talking about alien sinners, people that have never obeyed the gospel. They've not expressed really much interest in God at all. And Jesus is telling them, I'd rather you be that way than lukewarm. And we still think, well, again, surely somebody that's become a Christian, now maybe they're not as zealous as they ought to be, but surely that's got to be better than somebody who's never been a Christian. Well, not according to Jesus. He said, no, I'd rather you be somebody that's never obeyed the gospel, to be cold. Well, why? Right? When, when you think about it, first you say, well, after all, both of them are in a lost condition. If you're cold or you're lukewarm, you're, both of them are lost. Both of them face the same 
destiny or destination unless they repent. So there would seem to be some similarities as well. So why would Jesus say, well, it's better for you to be cold than to be lukewarm? Well, if we dig into this a little deeper, maybe we can understand. Once you really think about it, okay, I, I see what he's saying here. So let's think about two things. First of all, the unsaved person, somebody who's never obeyed the gospel, it's typically, it may be easier to convince those people that they need to change their life, they need to become a Christian, dedicate their life to God, maybe it's easier to convince them of that, about their, their lost condition, and they need to fix it. But, but what about the lukewarm Christian? And what about an indifferent, self-satisfied Christian? Okay, these are people who have deceived themselves. They think they're safe. It's kind of hard to convince them that they're not. That, well, you know, I've been baptized. I mean, I come to church every now and then. I warm the pew, right? And so it's maybe harder to make them understand that you've fallen away from God. Maybe at one point you were hot, you were zealous, but not anymore. And Jesus is telling us right here that he can't stand that. So, but it's harder to convince them because if they think, again, well, I was baptized, I'm covered, I, I'm, I'm in a good relationship with God, really hard to convince them maybe that they're not. It might be easier to convince somebody who's never obeyed the gospel. So in that sense, Jesus said, yeah, you'd be better off if you were cold because these people, they can't see their bad spiritual condition. They think they're perfectly fine. Whereas if an alien sinner, sometimes you know it's a little easier to convince them. So when you look at it that way, you can see it. Now, the other aspect of this is why it may be better to be cold than lukewarm. Think about the damage that can be done to the church. Those people that have never obeyed the gospel, they're outside the church. How much damage can they do? I mean, they can do some. But what about the people in the church that, again, they're indifferent, they're apathetic, they're lethargic, they're bored with God, they don't really want to dedicate, they don't really want to serve God. What about them? They can do a whole lot of damage to the church, more so than somebody who's not inside the building. Okay? Because we all have the ability to influence people, and that can be for good, that can be for bad. And so that tends to rub off on other people. If you see the people around you that are not very engaged, they're not very energetic, they don't really want to do that much for God, well, it's really tempting to fall into that rut yourself. Well, why should I exert myself? He's not doing much. You know, so you those people can really influence people in a negative way way and cause that to indifference to spread to other people. So they can do a lot of damage and they can also do damage to, to people outside the church. If they're thinking about yeah, maybe, maybe I should obey the gospel and then they see these people you know, well that guy doesn't seem very excited about him. Why should I join the church? I don't really see anything different between the guy that's in there and, and everybody else on the outside. We really have an influence, even if we don't realize it. So we have to be different. We want people to see that we are different, we are engaged, we are excited, whereas they want to be a part of that. Nobody wants to be a part of a dead church. Okay, it's just, there's no lure to that, right? And so maybe this is why Christ is saying, you know, you'd be better off if you were just ice cold because this indifference is really hurting the church. But the thing is, they couldn't see it. So again, going back to it, it may be harder to convince them of what they need to do. So let's look at what was Christ's reaction to their lukewarmness, to their indifference, to their uh, apathy. Well, as we said, the lukewarm food or drink, pretty gross, pretty disgusting. If you get that in your mouth, you're at least going to be tempted to spit it out. You put the, oh, that's awful. I don't want, you know. 
And that's what Jesus says here, right, in verse 16. I will spew thee out of my mouth. And, of course, he's talking figuratively, but the thing, he's saying, I will reject you because you are disgusting me right now with your lackadaisical attitude toward loving God, serving God. Jesus is disgusted by that. God is disgusted by that. And so he's going to reject them uh, at Laodicea. He's telling them, look, you're no better. In fact, you may be worse than the people who've never obeyed the gospel because of the things that, that we just discussed. Okay, they, These people, Laodicea, they were really dead in the faith. That's what they were. They, they, they didn't have an active faith. They were dead in the faith. And we want to notice, turn over to, hold your place there, turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. We want to notice, God will not accept that. He wouldn't accept it from the brethren at Laodicea. He's not going to accept it from us any more than he would from them. One of the lessons that we need to learn from this, we don't want to be like them. We don't want to be lukewarm. Look at Matthew 5 and 13. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Christians are supposed to be the salt of the but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So think about salt. What do we use it for? Well, two main purposes. Salt flavors up our food, and it also can help preserve our food. But if you have salt that's old, it's, it's lost its effectiveness, it doesn't really improve the flavor of your food, it doesn't help preserve the food, then what good is it? Nothing. Right? It's taking up space in my pantry. What am I going to do with it? Throw it in the garbage can. Right? Jesus said, you're supposed to be the salt of the earth. You're supposed to make a difference, but you're not doing it. So what good are you? You're not doing anything good for the cause of God, and so I'm just going to cast you out. That's what I'm going to do, unless, of course, you repent. But in the state they're in right now, that's what's going to happen. Well, what caused them to be that way? I mean, I'm sure at one point they must have been zealous for God. They must have been what Jesus would describe as hot. But they had clearly lost that. So what led them to be this way? Well, we notice the answer in verse 17. Jesus tells us. He knows. Again, he, he said, I know that. Well, I know exactly why you did this, but you need to fix it. So look again at verse 17, Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And then Jesus goes on in the rest of the verse. He tells them their true spiritual state. But they can't see it. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, that's where you really are. You think you're in great shape. But I'm telling you, this is your true spiritual state. But you're too blind to see it. That's what Jesus is telling. So what led them to this condition? Materialism. As we said, Laodicea was a wealthy city. A lot of commerce went on there. A lot of people had made a lot of money. And apparently, a lot of these Christians at Laodicea, they were pretty well off too. Okay? Because Jesus said, you know, you're saying to yourself, boy, I'm rich. I got tons of stuff. So obviously, a lot of them had benefited financially from the economic situation that they were in. So they had prospered, and they were very, you know, satisfied with themselves because they had prospered so much. They were not grateful to God for those blessings, they took credit for it themselves. Well, I did this. God didn't have anything to do with it. I'm the one that opened the store and sold stuff and made all this money, and boy, I, I've really taken good care of myself. So they were very smug and, and self-satisfied with the situation they were in. Now, think about us today. This probably describes the condition of a lot of people in the United States today. Being the history nerd that I am, I can't really think of another nation in the history of this planet that has been more blessed 
financially, materially speaking, than the United States of America. We have tremendous blessings here. Our poor people are considered to be rich in almost every other country in the world. So we've prospered, and maybe that's made us, forgive the expression, fat and lazy. Right? We've become complacent because we have so much. And so a lot of people think they are self-sufficient, and they don't need God anymore. Look at all the stuff. I look at this big house I live in. Look at all the money in my bank account. Look at these nice clothes I wear, this nice car that I... Who needs God? And people get that way, even if they don't intend to be. They, they get, again, they're, they're reliant on their own wealth. That becomes their God rather than the real God. And apparently this is what had happened to Laodicea. So they had compromised their faith for money and for possessions, for materialism. That's what they had done. Now, as stated earlier, a few minutes ago, we talked about Domitian a little bit, the, the Roman emperor, and he demanded by law that he be worshipped as a god. Now, do you think if somebody refused to worship him as a god, do you think there was a penalty that went along with that? You betcha. Now, ultimately, you could be executed. They could put you to death because you refused to do it. But before they got to that point, that was typically the last resort. Before they got to that point, the Roman law said, if you will not worship the emperor, then you cannot buy and sell. You cannot engage in commerce. You can't be a merchant, which apparently a lot of the Christians here, that's how they made their money. Okay? They were merchants. And so they were not allowed to buy and sell. And so many of these Christians who obviously needed that economic activity to maintain their wealth, if they decided they did not want to worship the emperor, that would bankrupt them. They would lose all the cool stuff that they had accumulated and, and the prestige of having all this money. And all that would go down the drain unless they agreed to worship the emperor. So they probably, we talked about this morning, talked about go along to get along. That's most likely what the Laodiceans did. They compromised. They said, well, you know, we don't have to really mean it, but we'll go along with the emperor worship because I don't want to lose my business. I don't want to lose my money. So we'll, we'll just go along and we'll worship the emperor and it's no big deal. Now remember, Way back, and I know this is a while back, but when we looked at Smyrna, Jesus specifically stated they refused to cave in to that. They were not going to participate or go along with the emperor worship. And because of that, they were poverty stricken because of this Roman law. You can't buy and sell, you can't engage in any kind of economic activity unless you worship me, the mission said. So Jesus said, yeah, you're, you're in poverty because of that. But at the same time, Jesus told them how rich they were. And people go, well, what? well, that doesn't make sense. Oh, you see, it makes perfect sense. Because Jesus is telling them at Smyrna, oh, you're poor in worldly goods, but you are spiritually rich because you didn't cave in. You didn't compromise. You worship God only. You're not going to worship the Roman emperor. So for that you are spiritually rich. Even though you're persecuted, even though you're poverty-stricken, you're spiritually rich. Exactly the opposite of Laodicea. They're materially rich, but as Jesus said there again in verse 17, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. Well, but they have all this money. How could they be poor? They're spiritually poor, which is the worst thing you can be. Okay? They were materially rich, but spiritually poor. So we saw that with Smyrna, Revelation 2 and verse 9, where Jesus talked about that. So it seems that the Laodiceans, they looked out for themselves. They did whatever they had to do to maintain their lifestyle. They did that rather than remain faithful to God. And God, of course, is not pleased with this. So then Jesus, of course, as we just read, he talks about their true condition. 
So you tell me that everything's great and you're rich and you're prospering and you're doing wonderfully, but that's not your true condition. They thought they had everything they needed. They didn't need anything. They didn't need God. Had everything they needed. They could not see, they could not realize their true spiritual state, which Jesus is going to point out to them. He says, no, matter of fact, you're not in good shape like you think you are. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, all negative connotations. You are all these bad things, but you can't even see it at all. And so Jesus is trying to point that out to them so that they can hopefully do something about it. Okay, so when he describes their spiritual condition, he's indicating to them that they were now lost eternal. Okay, so look at Mark chapter 8. Let's look at verses 36 and 37. Because they had come to the go, they didn't really need God. God wasn't that important in their lives. Well, without God, we have nothing. Okay, Mark 8, beginning in verse 36. Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man gain or give in exchange for his soul? The Laodiceans, they sold their souls for earthly possessions. And I'm sure they had a lot of money, but I'm here to tell you, whatever you sell your soul for, it's not worth the price. But they couldn't understand that. They deceived themselves. They believed everything spiritually was just fine because after all, they were Christians. They were members of the Lord's church. But as we've seen, this was not acceptable to Christ. So let's take a look at the remedy for this and the promise. This letter, like all the other ones, will end with the promise of a reward if they're faithful. But first of all, Jesus has to give them the remedy. They're in a lost condition. Well, what do they need to do about it? Well, Jesus is going to give them, again, he's the great physician. He's going to give them the prescription that they need. So look at verse 18. Jesus tells him, he says, I counsel thee, I'm giving you some advice here, listen to me, to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, spiritually rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Because again, they can't see their spiritual condition. So Jesus tells them, this is what true worth is. You're all obsessed with your bank account. And we all have to have money to survive, and we get that. But that's all that was important to them. Jesus said, no, this is true wealth, spiritual wealth. That's what you need. Okay? That's what you should be seeking out. Being a true Christian, he's saying, look, that's worth more than gold tried in the fire. In other words, refined gold, which man values very greatly. Not much worth more than refined gold. But all the refined gold in the world not worth the price of your soul. But that's what they were doing. So Jesus said, look, you need spiritual gold, not the earthly gold. That's not something that you can take with you. And he talks about wearing white garments. Now, is that literal? Well, you got to go out and get a white shirt? That's not literal. It's more of this figurative language, right? But he wants them to have white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, the shame of thy nakedness, does not appear. Well, if he's not talking about literal clothes, what's he talking about? Well, look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. Revelation 19 and verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's what the white garments represent. Righteous acts of the saints. So Jesus is telling them at Laodicea, you need to strive for righteousness. You need to put on the garments of righteousness. Again, it's not literal clothes. It's a spiritual sense. You need to be wearing 
righteousness, and that's not what you have been doing. Think about our literal clothes. Why do we wear them? Well, I realize for some people, it's a status symbol. They want to have, you know, a name brand suit or dress. or what. It's a status symbol. But realistically, people wear clothes for a couple of reasons. One is for decency to cover our nakedness, although that's becoming less and less mandatory, apparently. But to cover our nakedness, to cover being indecent. And then secondly, we wear it to protect us from the elements, from the rays of the sun or from the rain or the wind or the cold. That's why we wear clothing. It covers us, it protects us. Well, think about in a spiritual sense, righteousness, wearing the garments of righteousness, that protects our souls from sin and shame. And that's why Jesus said, you need to be wearing the cloak of righteousness to protect your souls from sin. That's what he wants them to do. And then he says, anoint your eyes. Okay, anoint your eyes. So he's telling them, you need to diligently be studying God's word, which because you're so lukewarm, you don't really do that anymore. But you need to be doing that so that it will open your eyes and you will not be blind any longer to your spiritual state, that you would be able to see. These are all the things I ought to be doing, but I'm not doing. And yet I call myself a servant of God, but I'm not really doing that. So Jesus wants their eyes to be open. So hopefully seeing their true state would lead to what Jesus wants, and that's their repentance. That's what he wants them to do is to repent. But, but you've got to be able to see it first. Nobody's going to repent if they don't think there's anything wrong in their life. Well, I haven't done anything. And that's the attitude that the Laodiceans have. So Jesus said, you need to wake up and open your eyes and you need to correct this. So let's look at verse 19. Notice what Jesus goes on to say. As many as I love... I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. There's the remedy. Okay? But something that's very, very important in this verse that we need to realize, because so many people, that they get discouraged by this today when they think about it, this is critically important for us to understand. Notice what he says in this verse, right? God chastens us. God rebukes us. Not because he's sadistic, not because he enjoys it, but because he loves us. We need to understand that. Okay? So people say, well, God is just too strict and he's too harsh. And he does it because he loves us. He's doing it for our own good, even if we can't see it. And that's what Jesus said. You need to wake up and open your eyes and see what's going on here. It's like a parent trying to protect his or her child. Now, I didn't see that as a kid, but now that I'm on the other end of it, oh, now I get it, right? So, yeah, I've had to punish my son. I'm pretty lucky. He hasn't been too bad, but from time to time, yes, I've had to rebuke him and chasten him, but why did I do it? Because I loved him, not because I hated him. Because I wanted to protect him. I wanted him to be safe. I wanted him to be smart. Same thing my parents did for me. Bless their souls. They had a, That was a tough job. Because I needed a lot of correcting. And I thought I knew everything and I didn't know anything. Okay, But now I look back on it. So yeah, my parents, they were, they were trying to keep me alive. They were trying to protect me from my own stupidity. What they were trying to do. Well, that's what God's doing. Okay? He's wiser than we are. He knows. When I think, well, I think that'll be a great idea. God's telling me, no, don't do that. That will hurt you. That will be bad. Well, oh, God, you just don't want me to have any fun. No, he's looking out for my best interest because he knows more than I do. He knows better than I do. And he knows what's best for me. And if I truly trust him, then I, I ought to understand that. And so he says here that he rebukes those who he loves. And so I prefer to be rebuked by God. Look, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. 
We want to look at verse 6 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 10. So verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God does this because he loves us and he cares about us. He doesn't want us to get hurt. He doesn't want us to be lost. Look at verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Talking about other people. Yeah, they may do it just for their own sick amusement or whatever. But he, God, for our profit, so that we might be partakers of his holiness, right? God's not doing it for his good. He's doing it for ours. God rebukes me because it says here, he wants me to be a partaker of his holiness. God wants me to be with him in heaven. And the only way I'm going to get there is I'm going to need to be rebuked and chastened quite a bit. That's why God does it. So we need to understand how important that is instead of fussing at God for, oh, I can't believe he got all these requirements. And it's for our own good. Now, all those years I taught school, one of the, the saddest things, and I've, I've heard this more times than I care to count, you'd always have as a teacher, you'd have these uh, some uh, kids. We, we talked about this morning, we're to love our fellow man, and we said some people are harder to love than others. Some students in classrooms have fit that category. You, you try to love them all as their teacher, but some of them are a little more challenging. And some of them act out, they do things. And, but here's the real sad part of that. Some of them, when eventually they get to a really low point and they, they have a fit of honesty, and they'll talk to you about it. And again, I heard this quite a few times over the years, but some of these kids would say, well, because you, why are you doing this? Well, you know, well, I act out because I want attention. The only time I get attention from my parents is when I get in trouble. If I don't get in trouble, they, they ignore me like I don't even exist. That breaks your heart as a teacher. It's like my parents don't even love me. They don't even care about me. They're so busy in their own lives and Oh, but if I get in trouble, then my dad's yelling at me, but at least he's acknowledging that I'm in the room. And that's really sad when you think about it. Well, for our spiritual state, would we rather God just ignore us and not care about us? Or do we want God to give us his attention? Which, of course, he does, but he does it out of love. We should want him to lead us to those things that are good for us, which is what God is doing when he chastens us. So we need to understand that. So then Jesus tells them, how do you fix this? Right there in verse 19, be zealous and repent. You need to repent for your lukewarmness. You need to repent for your apathy, your indifference. And you need to be hot again. The implication is that they used to be that way at one point, but they lost it. Jesus said, you need to get that back. But it's not good enough just to get it back. You've got to repent for all the times you've been lukewarm. But then you need to be zealous going forward. So Jesus gives them the remedy. Now, look at verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now this, to me, personally, is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. It's also one that has a lot of hope in it, so it, it's got some of both. But it makes me sad when I read that, because look what's happening here. Jesus is pleading with them to come back to him. He's begging them, please come to me, in spite of their lack of love, in spite of their lack of dedication, their lukewarmness that disgusts him, in spite of all that, Jesus still loves them and he wants them to come to him. He says, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Let me in. He could just turn his back on him and walk away. You guys are worthless. I don't have any 
but he doesn't do that. How sad is that for Jesus who died on the cross for us begging people because he loves us that much that he wants to come to us or wants us to come to him. I know just from my personal view, and this is not you know, self-pity or whatever, I really honestly feel like I'm not worth it. I'm just not. But the good news is, God disagrees with me. He thinks I am worth it. He thinks we're all worth it. In spite of the bad things that we do or failing to do the good things that we should do, Jesus is still knocking on that door. Come to me. So we want to notice here that we have free will. The same is true for us like it was for them. Jesus will not force himself on us. Could Jesus bust down that door? Oh, sure he could. But he won't. Jesus is knocking at the door. The door to our heart. Are we going to keep it locked? Or are we going to open that door and let him in? He's begging us to let him in. Just like he was begging the Laodiceans. We need to choose to let Jesus in. And then finally we see in verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. We've seen that urging in all seven letters to overcome. Those who overcome temptation, those who overcome sin, to serve God faithfully, they will receive the eternal reward of being with God in heaven for all eternity. Jesus said, you'll be by me in my throne for all eternity. If you overcome. Jesus knows what it's like to live as a human. And he said, even as I also overcame. Jesus overcame the sins and temptations of this world. And so many of us, we want to tell ourselves, well, I, I just can't, I, I can't do that. As my mom used to say, can't, never could do anything. I hated when she told me that. But it's true. Right? It's all in the attitude, right? So we tell, oh, well, I can't do it. Oh, yes, we can do it. The question is, will we do it? God would never put something in front of us that's impossible. God would not say, well, it's impossible for you to overcome sin, but I'm going to tell you to overcome it anyway. No. We can do it. It's just, will we do it? So Jesus said, if you overcome, then you're going to have that eternal reward. So as we wrap this up, we think about these. all these letters demonstrate that we all have a personal responsibility. Each individual has a personal responsibility to God. Each congregation received praise and or rebuke as their situation dictated. This was true for individuals within the congregation as well. These letters reinforce the idea that we see in Acts 10, 34 that God is no respecter of persons. Everyone has to do what God has said. And we know in Romans 14, 12, every single one of us, we are going to give an account of what we've done in this body on the day of judgment. That's true for the Laodiceans, and it's true for you and me. In each letter, we are told to over. We see that word in every letter. That's how we get the reward. So that means that failure to overcome means that we will be lost eternally. We will not get that reward. Now remember, these letters, who are they written to? They're written to Christians. They're, this is not written to alien sinners. This is not written to people who have not put on Christ in baptism. These, all seven of them, are written to Christians and it proves that Christians can fall from grace. The Laodiceans had done that. So these people that say, well, once saved, always saved, that is a man-made doctrine that is not supported by the Bible. These letters are to Christians. And we can fall from grace. Like the brethren at Laodicea, we must always be willing to re-examine ourselves Part of their problem. They, they were blind. They couldn't see it. They didn't look. Re-examine ourselves to make sure we are not lukewarm. 
in our service to God. We do not need to be lukewarm in our love for God. Remember how much he loved us. Should we do any less for him? We cannot be lukewarm. Let us be zealous for God so that we can lead others to him and we can all enjoy the eternal reward of heaven together. Those are the things that these letters to the churches in Asia hopefully have taught us. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to be baptized into Christ. That's the only way that you can be in a saved condition. And God has laid out that plan. And if you have that need, we can help you tonight. If you are a Christian, but you have, like the Laodiceans, you've lost your zeal for God, you've fallen away, you've become unfaithful for whatever reason, right now it's not too late. Jesus is knocking at the door to your heart. He wants you to let him. You let him in once. He wants you to let him in again. You walked away from him. You need to come back to him. Confess those sins. Repent for them. Pray to God for forgiveness. And he's promised that he will forgive you. And you can be restored to your first love. So if you have a need, please come forward. As together we stand and we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? What will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sins of life or of death. What will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one. He will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Good to see y'all. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Thank the Lord again for another fine lesson tonight. We all need to take heed each and every time. Is there anyone here tonight that's not had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper? Uh, please remember, service is on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Bible study, Monday, Sunday, Sunday morning at 9, 9.30, and regular services at 10.30, and then always Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Please remember, and uh, say a prayer for those that are sick. And say a prayer for Sister Nancy and, and all of our churches. All of them, not just this church, all of our churches. Please turn your song book to number 702. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have our closing prayer. When we walk with the 